Samuel chapter 9, and while you're doing that, I uh, just want to speak about something that we are inviting uh, the small groups to participate in in the next 40 days. Uh, at our church, we don't have um, classes per se, we meet in homes, and it's, we believe that developing friendships with people is very, very important because through friendships and through relationships is where spiritual growth happens. It's kind of a positive peer encouragement. And uh, if you've not yet checked out a small group and you're newer to the church, I would recommend that's like one of the best ways to make some friends and get to know some people if you're ready to do that. Well, anyways, in our church's history, um, you know, we always evaluate ourselves. We do, we do surveys and things like that. And the area of getting outside the walls and blessing people with the love of Jesus, which we call outreach, has uh, always scored like on the lower end, even though we really want to be an outreach church. When we actually look at the data and the numbers, we don't really get outside of our walls as much as we like to think. We don't have to feel bad about it. It's just a reality. But we want to try to change that a little bit. And so last week I mentioned I sent a letter to, uh, to the small group leaders and a lot, I think every small group has participated in outreach at some time in the past. We just want to try to create some kind of a, of a focal point where over a period of 40 days, our prayers and our energy and our planning and all that kind of stuff is all centered on, on this. And uh, we do church-wide outreaches, and that's cool. A lot of you uh, do individual outreaches, and we just love to try to get that middle piece, the small groups, to... Uh, to get more, a little more coordinated on that and kind of create a, a regular rhythm in our church year where small groups are at least doing something quarterly. So at the end of this month and through the month of uh, September, we're hoping that the groups will get together and we just invite everyone just to pray, hey, what are some cool things that small groups could do to get outside of the house, get out of the wall, outside the walls so it's no longer us four and no more, but it's something that we're blessing the community with. And so... I can't make anybody do anything. I don't really want to. It's not a lording over anybody kind of a thing. It's just a simple invitation. If your group meets, like, we don't want to do outreach. All right, don't do outreach. That's, that's your call. Um, I talked to Jesus about that. But um, anyways, that's just something that's happening, and we're calling it Get Out of the House. And I think it could be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's going on. I'll talk more about that in the upcoming weeks. Um, one thing I want to prepare you for is uh, about two-thirds of the way through this message this morning, I'm going to invite you to just be able to think about ways that God has been gracious to you. Now, you may not be a person of faith, at least not yet, and uh, you know this is not something that you think about, but the, to those of you who are people of faith, it's always good to review and remember how God has been gracious. And so this message is going to kind of prime the pump. And uh, later on, I'm going to give you a chance to just kind of think about that and maybe even talk to a neighbor about, hey, this is how I've been thinking about this. Man, God's been gracious here, and he's blessed me here, and he's just so good here, and that sort of thing. And it kind of is good for the heart. It's good for the soul to just give credit where, where credit's due. It'll be good, I promise. I can't tell by your faces, but I know it will be good. All right. Well, anyways, um, I'm going to read an awesome, awesome story in the life of King David because we're following him through the summer. So we're going to talk about grace. And just for fun, I did a Google search and just punched in grace. And it's kind of interesting what I came up with. I discovered that grace can be someone's first name. Uh, there's a singer, she might be famous, I don't know, I'm like so out of the cool world, what's cool, but there's a singer named Grace, and uh, there's, I also saw that Grace is something that we say before a meal, like we say Grace. Um, I also know, saw that there is a skincare product line called Grace, which maybe I need to check that out, I don't know. And obviously, um, there's, I saw that there's a song, a famous song with grace in it. Can you guess what the famous song is? Amazing Grace. Yeah, it, it gets sung by the, both secular and sacred. It's a powerful, powerful song. But, you know, it can be a little confusing. What's grace all about? What is grace? And so today we're going to talk about that. 
Um, my definition of grace this morning, uh, based on this passage and what the, the full counsel of the Word of God, the Bible says, is that grace is a generous, a very generous, faithful love with no strings attached. That's the key. It's a generous, faithful love with no strings attached. So let me ask you this question is, before I read this story. As you look at our nation, our country, and the way people are relating to one another, as you look at our community, maybe you look at your neighborhood, the way people in the houses or the apartments or the dorms, I guess, uh, relate to each other. Uh, maybe you look at your own family under your own house. Or maybe the way you relate to like extended family members, your, your relatives. Would you say that, you know, as people, you see all these different interactions, would you say that we are becoming, in the United States of America, a more gracious people? That we are growing in grace and the world is taking note? Or would you say that grace is drying up? So let's just do a quick little survey. How many of you think, whoo-hoo, grace is growing in the U.S. of A? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. How many of you say, oh, man, it's like drying up, like fast? Yeah. Good, because if you, everyone said the other thing, I didn't have anything to talk about this morning. <laughs> but obviously, I, I feel the same way. And I am so thankful that God has given us this story from the life of King David to help us understand God's grace, how we receive God's grace, and how we can give it out. That's basically where I'm going to go. What's grace? How do we receive it? How do we give it out? And so I'd like to invite you to stand with me out of respect to God's word, and I'm going to read uh, this chapter, 13 verses from the life of David. One day, David asked, is anyone from Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness? Literally, that means faithful love. Anyone I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who was one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? Yes, sir, I am. Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Yeah, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's a crippled in both feet. Where is he? In Lodibar, at the home of Machir, son of Amiel. And so David sent for him and brought him from Machir's house. His name was Mephibosheth. Isn't that a great name? Mephibosheth. Just rolls off the tongue. Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son, son Saul's grandson. And when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. Actually, he was thinking he was going to get killed. I'll tell you more about that, um, the, the practice of that culture. And David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. And he replied, I'm your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? And then the king summoned Saul's servant, Ziba, and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants who are to farm the land for him and produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 boys and 27 servants. Big farm. So Ziba replied, yes, Lord, my king, I am your servant, I'll do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table, like one of the king's own sons. That's a picture of adoption. And Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and from then on, all the members of Ziba's household were, uh, household were Mephibosheth's servants, and Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. Isn't that great? This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so what's going on? 
Well, in verse 1, David is uh, at the high point of his life. And I think he's feeling full. Right now, he is the undisputed king of Israel. When he first got started, there was division in the land. It took about seven years for the, the nation to become united under him. So now he's the undisputed king. Last week, as we talked about, now the ark of God, the presence of God is now in his city. He can go to the temple. He can go and worship and be with the Lord. God is close. He's excited about that. He's defeated Israel's worst armies. The, 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 um, and then he has captured the whole land. The economy is strong. I'm guessing his poll numbers are through the roof. And he's thinking back about what his life was like before he became king. He's a shepherd kid out in the middle of nowhere taking care of, of sheep. Then he thought, saw, thought about his days of suffering and rejection and living on the run, sleeping in caves and, and fighting the heat of the desert and the cold of the night. And he's just probably sitting there going, wow, this is so amazing. I'm sitting. It's happening. I'm here. I'm sitting on this throne. You ever have a moment in your life like that where you're just like, I mean, you, you, you just had a moment where, man, your life is full. You just realize, I am so blessed. I can't believe this is happening. I mean, my wife's not here, so she won't get embarrassed, but I feel that way about her. I'm just like, I can't believe she married me. I like conned her 20 years ago, and she still like is interested in staying married to me. It's so cool. I'm married to Tammy Carlsgaard. How cool is that? I mean, it's just like one of those moments. I'm just full. He's full. And, and so something made David think about his best friend, Jonathan, and a, and a promise that he made. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20 uh, is an exchange between he and Jonathan. And in this exchange, this is what happens. In verse 14 of 1 Samuel, it says, um, now they're talking to each other, and Jonathan's speaking, and may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all of your enemies from the face of the earth. And so Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, saying, may the Lord destroy all your enemies. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again, for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. Let me give you a little bit of a background of that exchange. Jonathan was Saul's son. And everybody knew that God had spoken to David, and he had been anointed by the prophet Samuel, and David was going to become the next king. Normally, Jonathan would be that guy. And so here's an amazing man, Jonathan. Here's a guy who is really, really gifted, and he's going to take his spot as a leader. And instead of like being suspicious of him like his dad, he actually befriends him and becomes, they become really, really tight and close. And so they're talking one day. It's almost like Jonathan has a premonition. And so he, he says, hey, you're going to become king I just ask that you would show loving kindness, loving kindness, loving, uh, faithful love to myself and, and to my family. And David must have been like, what are you talking about? And Jonathan said, would you just do it? And David said, yeah. And whatever they did, I mean, they looked each other in the eye, and these two men reaffirmed their vow of friendship. I got your back. I got your back. And so David, he's sitting on the throne, and he's just feeling full, and he's just looking at everything around him, like, man, a country kid sitting on the throne. What, what is wrong with this world? And he remembers Jonathan. He remembers that exchange. And so I'm guessing that's probably what prompted them to say, is there anyone left in Saul's family that I can show kindness to John, for Jonathan's sake? Now, in the original language, and I'll try not to kill you with this too much here, but in the original language, he uses a word in the Hebrew, that is the word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. And literally translated, that means faithful love, faithful love. I want to camp out and talk about this for a second because this is really important. When Jonathan and David were making this pact and Jonathan asked of David, will you show hesed to me? Will you show a faithful love to me? 
And then David looked him in the eye and said, I will show a faithful love to you, like they're making a vow to one another. That was the word that they used, he said. And so when David's sitting on the throne and he said, is there anybody in Saul's house that I can show Hesed, this faithful love to? This is what he's talking about. And this is a breathtaking idea. I'm going to do my very best. I'm like, oh, God, help me to use the words to explain this and bring it out. It's so awesome. It's so worth your time. I mean, it'll, it's something you'll think about all week long. So let's start with it. Hesed means faithful love. So let's talk about love, and then I'm going to talk about faithful love, because our country needs to hear this word. We need to be reminded or taught about the hesed of God, because this is what's happening. The love, the hesed, the grace of God is being given here at this moment. So that word love is a word that it does not mean feeling. In our culture, you know, that's kind of what pop culture seems to be telling us, that, you know, you, can, you feel love for one another. If I feel something, I, feel, I, have, I have warm fuzzies for you, then I love you. But when I've lost that loving feeling, then, okay, I'm out of love. So I'm in love because my feelings are with, with me, but now I'm out of love. And that's not what he's saying here. Has said, love is a decision. It's a decision. There's nothing emotional about it, really. I mean, it can be emotional, but it's not based on emotion. It's, it's, it's your will. You decide, I'm going to be kind to you. And so when I do weddings, I try to use the word kind because love is like one of those convoluted words, too. You can say, I love peanut butter and I love my wife, all in the same sentence. Makes the wife feel great, don't it? And so it's a decision. I'm going to be kind to you. Not only is it is a decision, but it's also a one-sided decision. I'm going to be kind to you even if it's just me. It's going to become a one-sided relationship for sure. Now, in our culture, tell me if I am wrong, but usually when you hear say something, you know what, that, you know that your relationship with this company, your relationship with this person, your relationship with this friend or whatever, it's like, hey, it's one-sided, meaning this person is taking from you. They're, they're, you're giving and giving and giving, and they're taking and taking and taking. And so when you say, oh, it's a one-sided relationship, usually what it means is there's a taking. What can I get out of this? But it's the exact opposite with God. It's one-sided. If God says, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to create a one-sided relationship here, it's going to be, I'm going to give you love. I'm going to be kind to you, even if it's one-sided. Not only that, but it's also generous. It's generous. In fact, it's so generous, if someone who is not a person of faith were to see what you're doing, like the kind of money that you're investing in this decision to love, or um, the kind of energy that you're giving to love this person, they might say, Dude, this is like borderline reckless because they don't get it. It just doesn't seem like it's a, the ROI, the return on investment. Is, it's not even 50-50. It's just a bad investment of energy. And that's, again, we don't get God because I'm going to talk about God and how he relates to us. Talk about a horrible ROI. God loves us with an amazing kind of love, and we are so fickle. And what we give back to God Compared to what God gives to us, I mean, if someone were advising God, <laughs> which you don't do, but if someone were to, they'd say, uh, my, your majesty, Lord, this is a terrible investment. This is a horrible investment. You'll never recoup your losses. And God says, I don't care. I've decided to love this person. It's you. It's me. So let's put, let's put faithful in front of that kind of love Faithful is a long-term outlook of this love. This isn't a one and done. I went to some weekend conference, and Monday through Wednesday, I'll give my husband a shot. And if he starts loving me the way I think he should, then I'll love him back. No. It's a long-term outlook. It's not a one and done. And so marriage is based on this idea. God created marriage. 
And at the core of marriage is hesed. It's a faithful love. And our country needs to hear this. I see just wrecked, I mean, just homes are being wrecked. Oh, man, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's so bad. I just see what's happening in our country. I, I see the next generation coming up and what they've been modeled and, and what they're thinking and what they're listening to and the Word of God isn't even feeding into that at all. And I just go, oh, man, my generation was bad enough. Now I look at the millennials coming up. Oh, it's going to be even worse. It's going to be horrible. Oh, God, help me, help me, help me to explain. That's that. A faithful love because people are just growing up and they're shriveling up. They're, they're drying up because of a lack of faithful love. See, we were created to live in this hesed. We were created to be loved like this. And we were created to flourish in this environment. And we were created to give it, give it, give it, give it out. But the problem is that we're cut off from God, and we're not receiving that hesed. And then because we're not receiving, we have nothing to give. And so we're trying to make it work. We're trying to make this relationship work. And it's like, I'm coming up empty. I'm coming up dry. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm seeing it. It happens to all of us. We need a fresh wind. We need a fresh fire. We need a fresh filling of the love of God. We need hesed. We need it. This Talk is so relevant. It's amazing. So verse 2, the story continues on. David asks, is there anyone I could show faithful love? You see this has said coming out? He didn't say, uh, is there anyone who like, lives close to me? Is there anyone who has this? Anyone who has that? I kinda, like, I'm going like, to create my pre-qualifications for uh, showing has said to someone. He just says, is there anyone? And then he said, well, there's this, this guy named Mephibosheth, but then he was quickly told, but, you know, he's crippled. See, we know the backstory of Mephibosheth, how he got crippled in 2 Samuel 4.4. Uh, when, when the palace heard that Jonathan and Saul were killed in battle by the Philistines, everyone panicked because they knew, oh man, that means David's going to be king. That means David's going to be coming here. Oh, man, Saul's been treating David horribly. I mean, he is going to clean house. And so everyone got scared because when a new king took over, he killed everybody. Just take away all the, all the potential threats. And so Mephibosheth's five, and so his nurse grabs him, and she's running in a panic. She's hysterical, and she drops him, and he fell, and his feet were probably broken now, I don't know why his feet were still crippled. Maybe it was because they were on the run and they couldn't find a doctor to help it. Maybe the injury is so severe and acute that there, you know, even physical therapy and all the stuff that we have today, it wouldn't have helped. We don't know how he got crippled. We know what happened when he got crippled, and we know that he is crippled. And so the guy said, uh, you know, Mephibosheth, but, you know, he's crippled, which likely meant um, this guy is not going to look good in the court, Your Majesty. He's not one of the you know, one of the pretty people. He's not one of these high-capacity people. He's crippled. And what's cool about David, because, you know, people with disabilities were looked down upon back then, not like today. Oh, wait a second. Has that changed? Do we, do we view people with disabilities differently? I hope so. David didn't say, oh, he's disabled. Oh, he's crippled. Well, how bad? I mean, does he, does he look bad? Like, is, is his arms, like, all shriveled up? Or, or, you know, like, does he have stumps on his legs as he's in the wheelchair? Because I want to, like, see his stumps. That's, like, really, that kind of freaks me out. None of that stuff. He said, well, where is he? And so he learns he's living in a pl- that Mephibosheth is living in a place called Lodibar. Lodibar, which literally translated means no pasture, which sounds like our family's garden right now. Okay, we won't go there. So, Lodibar was located in a place that was barren. It was empty. No pasture meant there wasn't a lot of grass growing there. Nothing was really growing there. It was a rural place. It was a place of poverty, rural and poor. And so Mephibosheth was living under the radar, probably in fear of King David's wrath of cleaning house. And to his horror, he, he saw a dust cloud coming closer and closer to 
where he's staying, and he heard, he heard the, the clatter of hoofs, and he saw the glint in the sun of their shields and their armor, and he saw these soldiers coming up to his house, and he must have freaked out. I mean, to his horror, oh, they found me. They found me. And uh, they said, come with us. The king wants to see you. Based on how Mephibosheth behaved before King David, I'm guessing the guys didn't say, oh, by the way, it's a good thing. Which I'm thinking, you could have like, saved the guy a whole lot of stress because that was a long horse ride all the way to the king's palace. And he's like sweating bullets the whole time. And, and so uh, he appears before the king with his crutches. Clink, clink, clink. And everyone's standing there looking at him. And there's David sitting on the throne, and he's working his way up to, to the king. And then the Bible says he bowed low. I don't know if he just collapsed before the king or what happened, but he bowed low before the king. And then verses 7 through 10, what happened that next must have made Mephibosheth's head spin. I mean, check this out. David doesn't order him killed. Instead, he says, I'm ordering kindness to you. You're not going to be killed. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you your grandpa's real estate fortune. You're going to live in the palace. You're going to eat at the king's table. And then David calls Ziba in. He sets everything up so all that farmland, all that, all that real estate can be farmed and properly managed and a profit can, can be uh, derived and and David's last words to him is, hey, let's get this guy cleaned up. Dinner's at 6. Be there on time. And that was it. Wow. I mean, he goes in there thinking he's going to get killed. Next thing you know, he's having dinner with the king at 6. Incredible. Incredible. And so verses 11 through 13, the Bible records, once again, yes, a crippled outcast was eating dinner with the king along with the rest of his flesh and blood family from poverty to the palace. Isn't that a great story? Oh, love it. And it's true. It's happened. This really happened. So what are the implications of your life? I mean, you're probably feeling good right now. Like, oh, man, it's so good to see that kind of stuff happening. Grace is drying up. I feel good about it, too. Let's get a little deeper than just feeling good. I want to talk to the Christ followers, to those who are a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, this story should kind of sound a little bit familiar to you if you've had a genuine encounter with God and you have been saved. This should get your pulse rate up because this story mirrors, or at least it should mirror, your own salvation experience. You are Mephibosheth. So in this story, I see us as Mephibosheth in some places, and I see, us, uh, I see ourselves in, in David. So you're Mephibosheth in this story if you're, if you're a follower of Christ. Uh, like Mephibosheth, we come from a royal line. But we have all, we've been separated from God, who is the king. And we have been crippled by sin. Like Mephibosheth, the king of glory, out of love for Jesus, has called you to himself. And in faithful kindness and faithful love, has ordered to take you out of spiritual poverty to the palace of God. He has adopted you into his spiritual family, and he has offered you fellowship at his table. The book of Revelation says that when Christ returns and he takes his followers with him to heaven, there will be a banquet table for us to enjoy the fellowship of God. God has offered you acceptance and love and his promise to take care of you. And so at one point in your life, you bowed low before the king. And you realized the king has every right to show me wrath. Now for Mephibosheth, this is where the parallel breaks down. But the Bible says we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glorious and holy standards. And the Bible says that the wages are the results of our sin and our rebellion against God is death. And so we deserve death. The Bible says that. And so, but when we come before God and we bow low before him, we realize we deserve nothing but death and we're waiting for the sword to fall, nothing happens. 
And we look up and we see a smile on God, the Father's face. And he says, get up. Get up. Jesus has stood in your place. He took your wrath. He took what you deserve. You're going to be a member of my spiritual family. You're going to sit at the table of fellowship with my family, with me. Dinner is at six. New robes of righteousness. And just a cool, cool experience. Isn't that cool? So thinking about this story, man, this should, this, this should cause a saved person to rejoice and thank God for his kindness. If this doesn't stir you in some way, pray and ask God, Lord, why? Why, do I, why am I no longer stirred by this kind of love? It can happen to any Christian, by the way. The book of Revelation says the Ephesians, at one time their love was so hot, it flowed like water, they wept for one another. But in Revelation it says, you have neglected, you have forsaken, you have forgotten this first love. And now you're all about doctrine, you're all about fighting all the injustice, fighting all the false doctrine that's in the world and that kind of stuff. That's good. I mean, I'm glad that you're doing that kind of stuff, but you're forgetting the root of all that. The root is love. You have forgotten has said. You have forgotten my loving kindness. You are not showing this loving kindness to yourselves or to, to outside of the walls. It can happen. And so my prayer for all of us is that when we hear a story like this and we understand this, this faithful love, this has said, something inside us should stir. And we're like, oh, that's right. That's right. I've been accepted by the king. And we humbly bow low before him, and we thank God for his kindness. You know, if you've never, if you've never received this offer from God, God brought you here today to hear this message. And uh, like Mephibosheth, in the story, you can let his example guide you as you become before God. Just humbly bow before God. Know that you don't deserve any kindness from him. Know that you have sinned. He hasn't been number one in your life. I mean, every decision your whole life, you've thought about how, hey, would this please God? Would, you don't look in the Bible and find out, hey, what is pleasing to God? What, will this decision bring glory to God? Shoot, I don't even do that every time in my week. And I'm like a pastor. I'm supposed to be like mature and everything. But I fall short. Even, even with the Spirit, even with... Nobody. I mean, our, our, we're not even close. And so you just bow before the Lord and said, say something like what Ms. Fibosheff said, who am I that you should show such kindness to someone like me? Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And just humble yourself before God and receive his gift of adoption into his family, his table of fellowship, his offer to take care of you and to love you. What a deal. I mean, why would you not want that? Why would you not want purpose for your life? Forgiveness for your sins, purpose and joy for now, and the hope of eternity with God. It's a great deal. I, I just, I encourage you, just think about it. And just say, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Come into my life. And, and you'll, you'll experience something that God will let you know. I'm coming in, and I get ready. This is going to be great. You know, another way that we can see ourselves as Mephibosheth is through the fact that he was crippled. And in Mephibosheth's life, he got dropped by someone. It was unintentional, but he got dropped, and he was broken. He was crippled. And because of his crippling, you know, he, he just didn't have a life that some of you kids have. I mean, he can't run around like you kids can do. Uh, he couldn't climb trees. He couldn't play hide and seek. He couldn't do any of that stuff. In fact, because he was crippled, he was probably, uh, he was probably looked upon as, as being odd. And so he was dropped. In fact, he was living in poverty. And he was alone. He was forgotten. You know, life has a way of, um, of dropping people. This world can be pretty brutal. And so... Someone gives their life to a company. They work as hard as they can. And then someone shows up at their desk and says, uh, reduction in force. 
uh, you need to clean out your stuff. We need to get you out of here in an hour. And they stand there and look at you. And you're like, uh, you don't have the box. And someone goes to the copy room and finds some flimsy old copy box and sticks it on your table. And you're like putting the pictures of your family in the box. And they're just like, you're numb. You're like, not even a thank you. I just got dropped because I was a number on somebody's spreadsheet. Or wife, she gets dumped by an unfaithful husband, and he has the gall to tell her, I still love you. I just have fallen out of love with you. Someone younger, someone who's not sagging in all the places, and you get dumped, you get dropped, and you poured your life into serving that guy. Unfaithful. Children get crippled by abuse. Just too many people that have been emotionally crippled. I mean, I could tell you more and more stories. I mean, you could tell me stories. I wonder if you've been dropped. I wonder if you've been crippled somehow in life. You know, normally in the Bible, when a cripple appears in the story, in some kind of account in the Bible, and they're mentioned, it's usually connected to a healing, especially with Jesus when he walked to earth. When someone was mentioned, someone was a cripple, they're, you know, they were lying on a mat, they couldn't get up, then something happens, and then God's, God heals them. Or in the book of Acts, you know, uh, the, the apostles, they said, silver and gold have I nothing, but in the name of Jesus, I can be, rise. You know, and they're dancing, and they're clicking their heels, and that's so cool. But not everybody gets healed. Even if you have faith, even if you're part of a church where the presence of Christ is so palpable, not everybody gets healed. Is that a surprise to you? I, that bugs me. <laughs> I mean, what is going on with all that? I'm so glad for the story because, because God showed me something in Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth didn't get healed. And he got a raw deal. But in the story, Mephibosheth got, Mephibosheth got something better. He got love. He got love. He got fellowship with the king at his own personal table. And so there's like this thing that the kids are doing. My kids do it from time to time. Would you rather? Would you rather do this or do this? It's kind of like, it's like a game. You can go to a website and do the, would you rather? Would you rather? And I'm like, well, let's do it. Would you rather? Would you rather be physically healed and then go back to low bar, no pasture, forgotten, all that kind of stuff? Or would you rather be loved with a hesed, a faithful love forever, where someone promises and keeps their word that they will take care of you and love you and accept you and make you a part of their royal family? Would you rather be healed or have that? I don't know what your answer would be, but for me, I'm like, ha ha, has said, has said, I will take the faithful love. I'll take it. And so, friend, do not, do not discount the kind of love that God gives to you. You say, but I'm still crippled. I mean, I still have that memory. I still have a scar. I know. I know. But sometimes God uses those scars and sometimes God uses those weaknesses to serve him in a glorious way that will allow someone else who is crippled and someone else who is broken to experience the hesed that God wants to give you right now to help you with your crippledness, your brokenness. You know, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 12, I mean, it tells how, how he cried out to God. He begged God over and over and over to relieve some kind of affliction. He was crippled in some way. But God told him, no, I'm not going to remove this. In fact, I'm going to give you something that's better than whatever you're asking for right now. I'm going to use that weakness to reveal a kind of grace, a kind of love that is so rich that Paul, in the same chapter, would later say, I'm so glad he told me no. I'm so glad he told me no. I'm so glad he told me no. I will, I will rejoice. I will find glory in this weakness because now I'm experiencing the presence and the grace and the love and the care and the assurance of God that I never had before. And so this weakness actually keeps me closer to God because we know how we are. When things are going great, you, you can forget God. 
But man, when things are going hard, it's a lot easier to turn to God, isn't it? And so he said, I glory in my weakness because his grace is amazing. So here comes the part that I talked about earlier. Just, I want you to think about this. I'm going to spend about 30 seconds just of quiet. How has God been gracious to you? And you don't even have to be a Christ follower. I mean, if you're a flat alley atheist, you don't believe God exists at all, then this part won't work for you. But if you believe that there's a higher power or God exists, but you don't really feel like he relates to you personally, you can still count your blessings, even though, man, you could have so much more. And if you know Christ, then you can definitely, definitely count your blessings. And so here's my question. How has God been gracious to you? Just think about it. Let's just close our eyes for a second and just think about, man, I can't believe that God has done blank. I can't believe that God has given me blank. Now, if you're kind of newer here or if you're more introverted, just ignore this part. And if first someone, someone wants to try to talk to you, they won't be offended. But why don't you just turn to somebody and just share just one or two or whatever where this is how God has been gracious to me. This is how he has shown his kindness to me. Just turn to somebody if you want to do that and just give a, like, kind of a private testimony of God's faithfulness. Yeah, so maybe you're looking at the story and you're like thinking about Mephibosheth and yeah, you, you see yourself. You're saying, man, I can't believe that God is showing me this kind of kindness. Don't refer to yourself as a dead dog. I mean, that's not, that's, just, that's not helpful, but I mean, that's what he said. But God's been kind. You know, as I reviewed my own life, I just think, you know, obviously I thought about my, not only my wife, but you know, children, my children. I started... I started thinking back over my life and the kind of guy I was, my attitude towards God, and oh my goodness, I was just thinking, I was such a bonehead at times in my life, and he should have just squashed me. He's like, man, the family that you're from, the example they have set, what is the matter with you? And he showed way more patience to me than I would have given myself. Awesome, awesome. I'm not sure what you said, but yeah, God is good. He's kind. All the time. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's just, well, I'm, I'm winding this down. And let's talk about David a little bit. Now, God is David in this story. It's a, it's a, it's a foreshadowing of, of the grace and the gospel of God. But David said something that I think we can put ourselves in that place. And I believe that because of this amazing grace, uh, we realize, wow, I am full and God doesn't want his children to hoard his blessings. We're blessed to be a blessing. We say that around here. And David wanted to pass it on. And I just wonder what could happen if we could 
basically pray a prayer, kind of modify what David said in light of, of the gospel of God and pray a prayer something like this. Lord, I'm so blessed. Lord, is there anyone to whom you wish for me to show kindness for Jesus' sake? Someone who's just drying up, someone who's been crippled, someone who's living in low debar, no pasture, no green, nothing green, nothing but dirt. And God says, they just, they just need you to look in their eye. They just need to see the love of Christ in your eyes. And they need to hear an encouraging word. They need to hear how God has blessed you and how he offers that blessing to anyone. It might happen at work tomorrow. I mean, sometimes you get asked at work, you know, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, I just wish I was doing what I was doing then. I don't want to be here. You know, that kind of stuff happens on Monday morning. But you can say, hey, it was great, you know. I just started thinking, yes, I mean, in church, we started talking about how blessed we are, and I just realized how blessed I am. And they'll say, oh, hey, that's great, man. That's good for you. And I was like, I'd say, no, it's actually something that everyone can have. It's like, hey, I never asked you this before. Do you have any kind of spiritual background? And they're like, hey, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Hey, that's cool. I was just asking, you know, sorry, tripped your weird meter there. Or they might say, oh, well, a little bit. I mean, no, as a kid, you know, we used to, you know, like, okay. Hey, if you ever want to talk about it sometime, I'd, I'd be cool. Let's get lunch. And just see what happens. Just see what happens. It'd be cool. I think it'd be cool if families could pray the same kind of prayers. Um, hear what I'm saying here. Families can be selfish. They call it family time. And I understand what, what's going on there, but... Um, you could take family time outside of your walls and take your family and model for your children a selflessness and a grace and a kindness to those who could use a blessing. And for a little kid to see their mom and dad or their grandma or grandpa doing something like that, they'll remember it. They'll remember it. It could be pretty cool. So I'll challenge you on that. Families, why not pray the prayer? Lord, who can we... And the kids will hold you accountable to it. You're like, hey, when are we going to do it? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. We've got to do that. Okay. And as I mentioned last week, we just love to see you know, the core value of outreach lived out through, uh, through our groups, our small groups. We want to be holistic. And uh, we want to see that in greater, greater ways. One group of, one small group earlier in the summer, they're, they call themselves computer nerds, and they offered free computer help to the community. And uh, I think they're still planning to do that again in this latest round that we're going to do. Our small group this Thursday, we're going to go to the Refuge, which is a ministry here in Greenwood that we support that helps the under-resourced. And we're just going to bring a couple crock pots of something, and we're going to serve a meal. And if you've never been to the Refuge, it's such a cool place because kids, students, adults, anybody can plug in. And so if you'd like to just kind of like audit the Refuge with us, just talk to myself, uh, Andy, he's in a red shirt too. I guess we decided to wear red shirts today. And uh, talk to us. Just say, hey, this is when we're going to meet. This will be there. Join us. The more the merrier. It could be a lot of fun. And so as our prayer is that in the next 40 days, small groups will brainstorm and perhaps pray a prayer like this. Lord, based on our gifts as a group, who we are, our passions, is there someone that we can bless? Get out of the house. Get out of the walls and just all of us just get in the community. Because if it's really true that grace and kindness is drying up, then as God moves in our hearts, I believe this. I really believe this. I believe we can move the needle. I think we can move the needle. And maybe one tick. But hey, man, a movement starts with one tick. I mean, one summer, but, you know, one snowflake doesn't amount to much, but you get a bunch of snowflakes together, you can stop traffic. And it starts with one tick, one notch. And I believe as God moves in our hearts, I think we can move that needle in the right direction. And, and for someone who's dry, we can give them living water, love, kindness. Because every person that we show kindness to in the next 40 days, they matter. They matter to God. They're most likely separated from the king. They're crippled. They're 
they don't know what grace, they don't know what kindness is. And it's going to make a difference, I believe, with all my heart. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you so much.